All right, good. Um, thanks to both of you for chatting with me. Um, I go off script frequently. I'll give you fair warning uh, about that. But um, I, I thought maybe what we would do to start with is that um, we're recognizing your professional lives. And you've done some incredible professional things. But none of us usually do that without some personal support from home. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about your families so we can uh, get to know you just a little bit better. So Hillary, I'm going to start with you. I realize you're representing Dispensary of Hope and lots of families, but I'd like for you to tell us about your family. Uh, sure. So um, I grew up in a small town in the Mississippi Delta and am the only child, uh, Brett and Gina Freeman. And so they definitely instilled in me my mom was a teacher. My dad worked uh, also in service for the government. And so that uh, just giving back and taking care of people, which is really why I went into pharmacy school. Um, so I loved being in that small town environment and um, knowing everyone in your community. And I think being growing up in that kind of rural area um, helped to kind of, and then going on to the University of Mississippi helped um, to kind of steer me into the path of caring for underserved populations, um, getting to sp even spend time here in DC uh, and turning on the Hill and uh, at HRSA with the Office of Pharmacy Affairs. So, um, you know, my parents definitely were heavily uh, involved and just so supportive in all of those endeavors. And then um, once I uh, landed in Nashville. Um, I met my wonderful husband, Chad. Uh, we've been married nine years and uh, we love to travel and do things in our community. And most importantly, we have a um, one-year-old son and four-year-old daughter. Um, and so we enjoy spending uh, a lot of our family time together. And my parents even moved up. His family is in uh, the Brentwood area. So we get to do a lot of fun family activities, like having a fun August birthday parties um, where I threw, I throw a fun uh, birthday party for my kids. It was a Mickey and Minnie Magic Kingdom where we had Mickey and Minnie even come um, for about a hundred people. So we go all out for birthdays. There you go. Yes. That's great. Good. Michael. Well, I grew up in a, a small town in, in Michigan called Bay City, Michigan. And my parents, I always had to be careful. They're retired, not dead. So they get upset when I say we're pharmacists. They are pharmacists, but retired. Um, <laughs> and they owned their own store uh, for over 30 years and uh, served a, uh, in an urban area in Bay City, Michigan. And I grew up in that pharmacy. And I saw everything that they did for their patients. And I had no idea really what was going on, but they had a lot of cool bottles and a lot of cool things in there. And people would come, even when they didn't need anything, just to come visit with them and bring them bread and just talk about things. And I just thought that was so cool. And so because of that, I never wanted to be a pharmacist. I, um, you know, they, they worked hard and they sacrificed a lot. And, I didn't know if I was strong enough to do something like that. And it took me a while to get around to it, but I eventually, you know, decided to go into pharmacy. Um, and I was every step of the way, you know, they own their store. So they went through training. I want to do a residency. They said, I don't know what that is, but okay. And then I said, I want to do a fellowship. And they said, okay, we don't know what that is, but okay. And I know they kept thinking, are you ever going to get a job? <laughs> and um, I went off to the University of Iowa, uh, where I had a, a you know, fairly successful research career, you know, early on, uh, killed a lot of fungus and test tubes and stuff like that. But there always seemed to be something missing. And because to me, that wasn't pharmacy. And I, I wanted to do more. So when an opportunity opened up to move back to Michigan, you know, to work for Ferris State University, um, we took that, we moved back and everybody I think was very surprised because I gave up my lab. I gave up everything we had developed there to go into, you know, this place at Ferris. And, you know, fortunately for me, that worked out incredibly well. Not only that I got to serve pharmacy, but I also got to, you know, raise a wonderful, actually two wonderful families, 
Uh, we've got, I've got three older children, Sarah, Rachel, who's here with me today, and Andrew. Uh, and then I've got um, two younger children, uh, Natalie and Megan. Um, so my age range of kids range from like 25 to six. Uh, so I'm sorry, but instead of the foundation, let's contribute to me. <laughs> um, because my wife has said, the, I, we always say the university tells me every day that I'm eligible to retire. And my wife tells me every single day, but your wife says you're not. <laughs> and so um, I, I've just been very thankful that they've put up with me. And, you know, really my family is one of my greatest joys. Um, and still, unfortunately, to this eight, you know, day, I try to be very involved. And I say unfortunately because it's going to kill me. Um, I coach uh, soccer and t-ball and everything like that. And I, then I look around and I go, I'm old enough to be half these people's grandfather. Uh, but I suppose it keeps me young. Yeah. Um, but, you know, pharmacy and what we've done has allowed me the opportunity to do that. And I'm That's very good. appreciative. Well, that's great. So the Pinnacle Award, um, what does it mean to Dispensary of Hope to get the Pinnacle Award? Yeah, well, it's really a, a significant uh, recognition of the work that we do at Dispensary of Hope, and it validates the efforts that we do um, helping low-income uninsured individuals across the country get access to medication. And um, we're just really thankful that um, and grateful for the opportunity to be able to be recognized with this great honor. So, so Hillary, I would say that you probably um, have dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of that might be dramatic in some way of, of people who've been helped. Is there, is there something when you think back to your time that you started down this road is there, uh, is there a story obviously protecting HIPAA <laughs> um, uh, or an event or a time that, you know, just really impresses on your heart where you say, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. This is the right thing. Yeah, we, um, we get to hear from um, stories from our, the pharmacists really all across the country that are running the programs and they're the ones that are handing the medications to patients across the counter and they're getting to tell them that this is free of charge. Um, and so um, I'll tell a story about Gilbert um, who was a patient at San Jose Clinic in Texas. And Gilbert um, had just been in the emergency department for heart failure. And as you all know, heart failure is an expensive illness, um, especially when you don't have insurance. Um, it's expensive to the patient, it's expensive to communities. And um, Gilbert was having to come back and talk with his family about how the next time he might go into the emergency department, might be his last. He was essentially having to say goodbye to his family. Mm -hmm. And Gilbert was in his fifties. Um, and so as he was researching and seeking help, he heard about San Jose clinic. And when the pharmacist was handing him the medication across the counter and telling him that it was free of charge, he said he couldn't believe it and thought that he was going to have to just say, no, keep it, just as he had, you know, other pharmacy experiences in the past. And so now Gilbert has been able to take that medicine, and now he can more confidently have more years with his family. That's awesome. That's really a really great story. Inspiring, quite. Now, Michael, um, I am struck by the fact that the COVID pandemic um, came out of nowhere. But the work that you did, you were doing diligently for years and years and years. Did you ever think about how that work might actually dramatically impact a huge population, i.e. the entire U.S. population? What, what is that? I mean, reflect on that just a little bit. So I had never and this is indicative of my career i'm poor at planning and, <laughs> and and so maybe i don't know where these things come from but um <laughs> my wife and i were at a meeting on influenza um here in washington in 2007 and at that point in time bob cadillac uh who is special assistant to president bush got up and gave 
the government's response to a pandemic. And I'm shy and introverted. And so I ran right to the microphone and I said, you know, this was a great presentation, but you forgot pharmacists. And he said, I couldn't agree with you more. Meet me over in the corner. I assumed right then I was going to get beat up and rolled. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he said, you know, I appreciate that. You know, would you come to my office and let's talk? And so um, he invited my wife and I to his office. And at that point in time, trust me, I was not a point of care test expert. I had no idea barely that these existed. And as we were sitting in his office talking, he, you know, we both kept saying pharmacists can do more than just dispense the medication. And it just clicked to me. I just remembered these tests. I said, have we thought about point of care testing in pharmacies? And he's like, kind of. And so we developed that. Before I left that meeting, we had a clinical trial all ready to go. And it was initially to prepare for the next pandemic um, because that's what we felt the need was. But as we went out then, we realized quickly with so, like so many other things, you can't just implement things, turn something on and off like a switch. People need the practice, they need the experience, they need to develop the infrastructure. And you know, so that's what we were training for this whole time. Now, thank goodness it took out of life as its own and began you know, being having more benefit for patients and for pharmacies, but it, it really did. You know, it made me feel good that the reason we set out to do this, it paid off and it kind of functioned. I mean, you know, we were talking about the pandemic hit, I get a call, hey, what's this nasal swab stuff? Uh, and, and so we, and I already said, we've trained thousands of pharmacists already. They're out there, they're ready to go. And so it wasn't like all of a sudden it's like starting from scratch. And so that to me was like, you know, validation, you know, for all those years of work that, you know, we really had planned well and did what we accomplished to do. Yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, if, for our audience, if you think about where we're at now and where pharmacy practice is expanding to, uh, test and treat is the topic of the day. I mean, it's the thing that we're all focused on and trying to get state laws passed to uh, allow pharmacists to do it in states where they can't and get pharmacists paid in the states where they can. And um, and I think it's probably the hottest topic in Washington right now uh, as well. So uh, uh, thank you uh, It uh, on behalf of a grateful profession for the work that you did to help get us to this spot. And I know there were lots of other folks too that deserve that thanks, but I really appreciate it. And uh, it's good. You know, uh, Hillary, I have to tell a little story that you may not know or remember or may have not been aware of, but um, I was on the faculty at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama for a really long time. And uh, I was at the Jefferson County, Alabama Department of Public Health as the ambulatory care pharmacist uh, and worked in a physician's uh, uh, based practice there in AmCare and also did uh, the uh, uh, international travel. And I don't remember what year it was, around 2010 or so, I heard from R. Clayton McWhorter, uh, who used to be the CEO of HCA, Nashville-based company, that there was this company co that was upstart in uh, Nashville um, and uh, Dispensary of Hope and that, that we needed to check into it and see what was going on and, uh, and, and get some information. And our health department was having trouble because we were trying to provide safety net care uh, in the local community. And I'd already visited with what is now the Ascension Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, um, uh, yeah, St. Vincent's. And, um, and, and so we made phone calls. And I had, I don't remember now who I talked to, but it was uh, uh, an early day conversation about how we increase access to uh, patients who otherwise couldn't afford their medicines. And I remember that very clearly. And so, you know, everything starts as a seed and then it's watered and fertilized and then it grows. I, I wonder if the Dispensary of Hope team had any imagination about how big it might grow or how big it's become. You, you think maybe you could reflect what they're thinking? <laughs> well, we do have one of our founding team members of Dispensary of Hope, who's now our interim CEO here with us, Scott Cornwell. So um, I'm sure that he uh, he's seen it grow quite a bit. And even in uh, that from being uh, started out of Second Harvest Food Bank and then 
to our location that was a 10,000 square foot warehouse to now a 20,000 square foot warehouse. And then we're, you know, planning our distribution center because how can we continue to bring in more and more medications to serve more uh, pharmacies and, and clinics across the country? So even in just the time that I've been there, which will be nine years in November, um, it's gone from 80 sites to now over 260 38 states across the country. Um, and so it's, it's really grown a lot of word of mouth, but just a lot of pharmacists. And I'd be remiss to say, you may have even spoken with David new, who's the VP of pharmacy at Ascension St. Thomas and was really one of the brain childs of how do you implement that in an outpatient pharmacy setting? And then Chris, Tony, my colleague, um, who, figured out how to do a charitable pharmacy, a standalone charitable pharmacy. We hear about free clinics, um, all the time, but I really wasn't as familiar with a charitable pharmacy until my time with dispensary of hope. So, um, creating more awareness about that and just seeing that grow. Um, we've got, uh, locations of charitable pharmacies starting all across the country, um, Branson city, Missouri, um, with Heather Lyons, Bernie, uh, a UMKC, uh, yes, um, faculty and, um, even up in, in the East coast in New Jersey with the Ritesh Shaw charitable pharmacy. So it's just continuing to grow and expand. And we love having, um, strong health system par partners as well. who can really, um, capitalize on that growth. Um, and they've got those multi-site locations and, um, can really get that whole patient care from all the different sites from discharge all the way to, um, seeing patients in the clinic. So, yeah. So, so many, uh, young people today would say that they enter pharmacy and well, not just young people. Some of us that are a little older could reflect on this too, that they entered pharmacy because they wanted to help people. And uh, I think this is foundationally exactly what's happening at Dispensary of Hope. You're helping people and, and you're also helping people. Both of you, it strikes me, are helping people to innovate. You're teaching the values of innovation. So, you know, there's lots of students uh, that may watch the recording of this lecture and, uh, and there's a few in the room. And I wonder, Mike, if you could just reflect to students about what it means to be an innovator and why they should think about how they approach their professional careers in an, it, it, with a bent toward innovation. No, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, unfortunately in pharmacy, sometimes we lament that we beat the innovation out of our practitioners. Um, we have them check boxes and follow rules and that's horrible um, <laughs> because there's nothing that's perfect in this world. And um, I've always, you know, told students, always question me, always question what you're doing, ask why. And I think, you know, somebody, well, how do you innovate? Uh, I, you just ask why. I mean, that's the only thing, there's no magic sauce, okay? You just have to question. And eventually you start asking questions and you realize there's no answer. Or some of you just say, well, why do we do that? Well, just because we do, not good enough. And so that's where the innovation occurs, you know, to see if there's a better way to do things. You know, when we started thinking about point of care testing, those tests were not new. They were sitting there on the market. You know, we in pharmacy have been doing, you know, glucose testing. We have been doing Clestex, you know, for years, but we just kind of left it there. And you have to look for opportunities see what the needs are. Don't always just have your mind set up with what you're going to do. And this is what I'm going to do because I'm good at it. Think about what the needs are. And between the whys and the needs, sometimes you come up with some pretty cool things. Yeah, that's great. The whys and the needs, innovation. So um, there's something about the heart of taking care of other people um, in, in a unique way. Uh, so while what Dispensary of Hope did is innovative, strikes me there's also a lot of passion behind it. There's an awful lot of heart behind it. Talk about that. What does, what does having heart for something and passion, uh, what lesson would you give to students about that? 
Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, we hear that question all the time is, um, the whole like good to great, how, what are the three things that you have to do to, to, what are you passionate about? What are you good at? And, and what can you make money at? And it's kind of, that's kind of that hedgehog principle. Um, but I love the topic of innovation. And I think, you know, growing up in a small town, I'd never heard the term entrepreneur and, uh, you know, I was going to be a doctor or a law and pharmacy. Uh, and so I think what has always drawn me to, um, dispensary of hope is our innovative model. We're connecting that abundance with need and, um, we, you know, connecting those pharmaceutical manufacturers, um, to the nonprofit care delivery system is really novel. Um, and, uh, we've got pharmacists who are being very creative in putting, um, all different types of programs together so that no patient is left without access to medication. Um, I think that the heart of the team at Dispensary of Hope, we're all, you know, we're all drawn to this mission, care for the vulnerable and care for the underserved. I think that that's, you know, could we make more money maybe down the street or somewhere else? Maybe, but um, I think that we're all, you know, well compensated, but it's really the mission, um, care for the poor and vulnerable that draws everyone there and um, is why, you know, we've been there, you know, nine, 10 uh, years later, continuing to make a difference in uh, the populations that we're serving. Well, I'm going to ask a question about professional involvement. We're in a time uh, in our profession and, and in our society where people are unplugging and very um, focused on self and maybe not uh, paying attention so much to the bigger picture. Um, I know both of you to be very professionally involved individuals and engaged in um, your profession beyond just the work that you do as pharmacists on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'd like for you to just reflect, um, especially for listeners uh, who might be watching this after the fact, um, what has it meant to you to be involved in your profession beyond just what you do in your labs or practice or, or clinical uh, care? Michael, we'll start with you. Same question then for you, Hillary. Yeah. So for me, first off, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, in the video, I can't do any of this alone and I'm not the smartest person. I don't know where everything is, but I've been very blessed to have, you know, strong uh, state associations. I've been blessed to know people at a lot of national organizations um, who, for some reason, still answer my emails, man. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and they don't just delete it and hang up the phone. Uh, and so that's been wonderful for me. And so people, I think, see professional organizations sometimes as kind of like this nebulous little thing over here. It's a box and we worship the box because look at those cool people and stuff like that. But no, the organizations are there to help us, you know, as practitioners, as a profession and stuff like that. And as I'm going along and taking advantage of that, I'm trying to bring students along, you know, as well. And I try to involve students with every aspect of what we do. Some of the, the really, you know, interesting things and some of the more mundane, uh, just to show what it all takes and just to show, you know, you don't have to do it by yourself uh, and that we're in this as a community and the uh, associations and the organizations um, really, uh, you know, can help support us with that, but they need our help too. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, I always love talking to our students about uh, what they can do to be involved in the profession. We've got one of our students here that was on rotation with us, uh, Lainey Murph from my alma mater, uh, the University of Mississippi. And, um, you know, being a Mississippi girl and growing up, uh, going to Ole Miss, I really knew and was well connected in Mississippi, even though I had Tennessee roots. Um, but the best way that I found to get involved in the profession, and we've got uh, our former state exec, Micah Cost here, and our current state exec, Anthony Pudlow, um, so yay, Tennessee, um, at, here. And so just, just last week, I um, had the privilege of getting to be at the TPA headquarters and involved with the strategic planning for the next uh, – strategy plan for TPA. Um, working with colleagues, that's the way that you get to network 
and enjoy, learn from each other, hear what others are doing in their uh, parts of the profession. Pharmacy is such a diverse um, field and we have people doing amazing things across the country. And it is just such um, a uh, inspiration to be able to hear about those and to participate. And so um, getting involved, not only at the local level, but then also, of course, nationally, um, my uh, other colleague here, Ashley Pugh, she's now on the APPM exec committee. And um, I've had the privilege of serving, um, being elected in that position, serving 2021 to 2023. Um, I love being involved with uh, the foundation's inaugural women in pharmacy committee and uh, getting involved in those ways. And so there's just really so many different ways to get involved. Um, again, it has to be what are you passionate about? Women in leadership has certainly been a passion as has been um, underserved populations. I'm going to ask uh, just to give the audience a heads up one more question of each of our winners, and then it's your turn. So be thinking of the questions that you would like to ask, and we'll give you the opportunity to ask those questions. So, Mike, I want to talk about CHARM. You mentioned a program uh, in the video, uh, uh, but we didn't hear many details about CHARM. Tell us a little bit about that and, uh, and its impact. Right. So um, I'm trained in infectious diseases, and going back late 90s, you know, the thing that was in vogue was antimicrobial stewardship on the inpatient side. And we've done a lot of great things. But the thing that you come to realize is less than 20% of all antibiotics that are used in humans are actually used in the inpatient setting. And in the outpatient setting, we had no idea who was getting them, how they were being used, what they were being used for. It was pretty much the Wild West. And a number of years ago, a student and I uh, decided to do a project for her capstone uh, we just wanted to track the antibiotics that were being used in the clinic. And this was unique because people really didn't do that. And one of the reasons, there wasn't a lot of the resource or the interest. You know, from an ID standpoint, outpatient infections are usually kind of boring. They're not like the big CREs and all these other uber-resistant things. And so th the effort hadn't been put in. And so we came up with a way to extract data from the EHR of our um, health systems clinic, or um, EHR, and not only do, could we report what was being used, but we developed a method to link the prescription with the diagnosis and then look at guidelines and link the dose duration and treatment along with you know, a variety of other things, including social determinants of health, you know, related to the use of the antibiotic. And this was a student project, no funding, no nothing. You know, we did it you know, pretty quick and dirty and it worked. And you know, we started talking to our state health department and they said, okay, we'll give you a little bit of money to grow it. And we did that and they liked it. So they gave us a lot of money uh, <laughs> to, uh, you know, onboard everybody in the state, you know, for that. And we were able to grow Charm out of that. Um, Charm now tracks probably over 65% of all the outpatient antibiotics in the state of Michigan um, in clinics. We're also doing, we're doing um, urgent cares, physician clinics, emergency departments, urgent cares. And I'm getting ready to write for a grant for veterinary hospitals and veterinary clinics. So we had based been, been based primarily in Michigan with that, but then we started to go into other states with pilot programs with some other health systems. And slowly that's grown into, we're I think in about eight other states. Uh, and we've got two other health systems or two other um, public health departments who are starting to fund for us. Michigan invested a lot in us to build the infrastructure. And now we're able to offer to all these other sites, you know, relatively inexpensively. And so we're able to use what we've developed, you know, and give to other people. And it's been remarkable, you know, to see this, you know, student project, you know, grow into what it has and have the impact, you know, not only just, you know, because we can track it, but you need that for JCO accreditation for clinics. There's HEDIS measures related to antibiotic use in the outpatient setting and all these things we're stumbling on. And then we all of a sudden we're realizing again, we've got payer race, age, zip codes. Oh, these are social determinants of health kind of things. And then, so that's been really interesting as well. Now looking at those factors and how they you know, relate to antibiotic use all out of a, a, a simple student project. Pretty amazing. Um, 
Dispensary of Hope clearly has to have a wonderful partnership with pharmaceutical manufacturers. And you mentioned uh, over 50, I think it was in the video is what you were talking about. It's uh, not every day that a pharmacy works with a bunch of manufacturers directly. That's uh, kind of an unusual thing. Maybe you could reflect a little bit on that experience of working with manufacturers. And because I was asked, I, could, I was told I could only have one more question. I'm going to give you a second part to the question. Okay. <laughs> the second part to the question is uh, the pills in the bottle are just the first step in a patient's uh, good health uh, supported by a pharmacist. Uh, that's great, but we have to make medicines work as well. So maybe you could then also reflect on how pharmacists uh, that are affiliated with dispensing of dispensary of hope are helping make medicines work too. Well, partnerships are absolutely vital to our model. And as mentioned, we do work with over 50 pharmaceutical manufacturers and they donate medications directly to our distribution center. And then we distribute those out to our over 260 nonprofit health systems, pharmacies, clinics, FQHCs, safety net clinics. Um, and so it, it wasn't always, we started as, as branded samples. Um, and so the model has evolved over the years. And I think that, you know, our uh, founding team members took that chance. They had built a proven model that works, um, getting samples and getting those to charitable clinics around town. They were able to do that and then build that with um, trust and integrity and relationship. It's all about relationship. And so we've got to be present um, with manufacturers, with these nonprofit health systems and communities. Um, and then it's really the pharmacists that are helping to make sure that patients are adherent to their medications, um, doing those therapeutic interchanges, collaborative practice agreements. They're the ones that are um, doing the ordering, managing their inventory, doing all the things that pharmacists are really great at. And so that's kind of that secret sauce are our pharmacists like at Ascension pharmacies and then other pharmacies. We work with lots of other ones across the country. We have some of our Ascension friends and here today. So um, just really, it's all about the collective effort. Um, and that's what makes the model a success. It's great. Okay. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask uh, either of our award winners, please raise your hand and we'll have um, our staff come around with a microphone. Uh, that includes those of you in the galley. We have good uh, AV in this place. So thanks to the APHA Board of Trustees. Um, so anyone at all who wants to be first? All right. Just you, Hillary. Don't get nervous. It's all good. So uh, <laughs> go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I, I'm Paul Malo. I am the uh, national director, senior director over 340B and metaffordability for, for Ascension Corporation. So um, and I am the liaison to the dispensary of hope as it relates to our pharmacies, our community pharmacies. So my question for you is one thing we hear a lot about is no margin, no mission. And Caring for the poor isn't always, you know, considered lucrative. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, because I think it's really important, what Dispensary of Hope has done to show us that caring for vulnerable patients actually can be profitable in a way that helps us to, to subsidize the care we're giving to, to our patients. Right, absolutely. Um, and I haven't yet talked about that, but it's an important part of what we do is um, to prove the, the model works um, through independent research. And we've worked with um, first the advisory board company in 2015, who took about 400 patients at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville and followed them pre and post enrollment. And they found that they had fewer inpatient visits, their length of stay was shorter, and it was saving the health system over $2 million annually per thousand lives. We put that into a white paper and we get to share that with various stakeholders all across the country from funders, other manufacturers. This is what the impact of your donations are doing to the health systems and communities um, in order to administer the program that 
getting patients access to medicine is going to make them healthier. And so we've also gotten to expand that smaller study um, with a multi-site system and worked with RTI International. And that was recently published in fall of 2023 in uh, JMCP, um, which yielded even more significant savings of $3.1 million annually per thousand lives. So um, it is a, a little bit of a unique program, but we can show that we can even show cost savings um, and it's the right thing and, the, and a great thing to do for um, our friends and just helps with all of those health equity initiatives. That's great. Who else has a question? Oh, and I know this group is not shy because I know all of you and you're not shy people. So don't be shy. Okay, Dr. Groves. Hello. Well, thank you both so much. It was really um, wonderful to hear about the experiences that you've had and um, honestly something I think really exciting for all of us to look towards um, as we continue uh, making different progress and, and moving forward into different patient care areas. Um, so I was wondering, um, you know, you've ha obviously highlighted some of the things in your family life and in your professional careers, but maybe what's one of the, we have some couple learners um, in, in the room with us today. What are some words of wisdom, um, something you had to be pretty resilient and, and probably work through a lot of different challenging situations. So from both of you that you really felt like could be, be helpful, how do, you, how do you move through some of the challenges that you had to participate and, and work through to get to where you are today and the great accomplishments that you've made? Yeah, was it all smooth sailing, Michael, or did you run into a run into a bump in the road once in a while? It was Tuesday evening. <laughs> it was six thirty p.m. and I got a call. It was from the Michigan State Medical Society, uh, and the person said, "What you're doing is illegal. Stop right now, otherwise we are going to prosecute you." And I said, "I'm sorry." How did you get this number? <laughs> and but I mean that those were the the challenges. And you know it's interesting because this was the you know the liaison or whatever from their medical society, you know, calling. But then when we started talking with the medical society, you got to realize very quickly, well, it wasn't them, but they had to do that uh, initially. It's like, oh, you don't have to call me at home. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of pushbacks along the way, a lot of bumps to the road. I mean, when I first um, came away from my conversation, um, it was like I was trying to convince people to buy a three-headed dog. Uh, you know, stick swabs up people's noses in a pharmacy. Are you kidding me? That's just stupid. Nobody's going to go there. Nobody's going to do that. It's like, okay, maybe this is stupid. Okay, but let's just try it. And it took time. And even Alex Adams, uh, who many of you know, um, I think I met young Alex, second day on the job uh, in an Institute of Medicine meeting, and I started going off on point of care, and I could just tell he's like, I don't know what this loco is talking about, and it took him three years, and out of the blue, I get a random call from Alex, I think I get it now, are you ready to study this? And so it, it doesn't always go on your timeline. Uh, even good ideas can seem bad at, at some point in time. Yeah, there's some people tell you all the reasons why you can't do something. You can't get billing. You can't do this in this state. You can't do this. Eh, maybe you can. You just haven't figured it out. And so don't let that dissuade you. Um, try a couple times before you say, okay, maybe I got to try something else, but don't give up. Uh, and don't listen to the naysayers. Um, you know, have people around you. And my brother was a great person with this. You know, right from the get-go, I thought, man, it'd be great to do sexually transmitted infection test and treat in pharmacies. And he just looked at me like, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're, keep, we're keeping it above the waist. And, 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 and so all ideas maybe have their time. They're not on your time. That's right. That's great. Fantastic. Some further advice? Yeah, I would, would just echo that, you know, there wasn't a, a pharmacist position at the Dispensary of Hope when I started there. So I um, initially started as a volunteer and thought, what a great mission. I've always loved to give back to my community. And then um, they called a few years later and said, hey, we've got some funding and want to hire a pharmacist. And I thought, gosh, 
I guess I'm early enough in my career. I can take a little bit of a leap of faith. So, um, all that to say, I think that a lot of times, you know, your career maybe won't go exactly how you planned or what you thought, um, as soon as you're graduating from, uh, from, you know, your, uh, college or even finishing residency. And so, um, being able and to t- say, yes, take opportunities, um, you know, having some great mentors, um, is always really, uh, very helpful. Um, and yeah, do, doing some things that are a little bit outside the box, you know, finding what you're passionate about is great. Um, but just being willing to kind of say yes, um, is, uh, can definitely lead to some unique opportunities. So I'm going to ask you a question, just a quick answer here. When you far- started pharmacy school, you imagined you were going to be doing what when you graduated? What 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 was it that you thought you were going to do when you started pharmacy school? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I I'm not sure I had that had thought that far. You hadn't figured it <laughs> I out. Don't know that I had figured that out. But I do remember <laughs> um, being at you know my fourth year and thinking like it was just like this magic like just wealth of like a kind of booklet just kind of fell into your lap of all the rotations and things. I had no idea that, um, you could pharmacists could do so many different things. Um, because a lot of our initial pharmacy experience and a lot of the the public kind of persona is, you know, your traditional community or hospital pharmacy, um, experience. And I think that's one of the reasons even why I was so drawn to starting a podcast on interviewing pharmacy leaders and kind of telling about those unique, innovative career paths and stories. Um, so that to kind of scale that, that, so people can kind of find out about that outside of maybe the Dean's hour, um, (laughs) some things. So so Hopefully. Did, did you have it all figured out, Michael? What about you? Uh... I actually did have it all figured out, but I had to figure it out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, from the day one, P1 year, I started working at a hospital, loved it. They had a clinical coordinator position that was opening up. All they had to do was finish a residency. And I was going to go back there and step into that. And every step along the way, I kept telling people, don't let me do this. And as soon as I said that, I ended up doing that. Uh, I, you know, when I was in my residency, I said, don't let me do a fellowship. I did a fellowship. When I was in a fellowship, I said, don't let me go into academia. I went into academia. <laughs> and, and so be careful of the things you don't wish for, <laughs> because sometimes those are the things that are, you're meant to do. Yeah. And sometimes you avoid things that maybe make you uncomfortable because you've got a, a comfort area or it goes against what you envisioned. And maybe your subconscious is trying to tell you something. Uh, by doing that and just take some time and listen because yeah I thought I had it all figured out I mean young brash you know 22 year old Mike was gonna do gent dosing for the rest of his life I think (laughs) and uh, yeah now I'm sticking swabs up people's noses (laughs) now um, Hillary one of the we're gonna have is there someone else with a question Uh, just so I've Okay, great. Jing, I'm going to come to you next. Let me ask this quick question of, of Hillary. So you said something, uh, just skimmed over it when you told us about your family history, but I don't want to pass it. You said that you worked on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, uh, as a, as an L.A. Uh, the L.A. as an intern. As an intern. Okay. Let's talk about that. Here we are. It's uh 2024, and the House Ways and Means Committee is going to likely mark up a bill uh, this week or next um, for health care. And there is a component that they are contemplating putting in that bill called ECAPS, which is the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacist Services, uh, that we've been trying to get passed for a long, long time. Uh what do you think about uh, pharmacist involvement in political uh, activities? Is it important for pharmacists to get involved in politics? Is it not important? Uh, if there's anyone in this room sitting on the fence, can you help me push them over? Can you help me push them over 
really quick. <laughs> well, you know, it's always said, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> and so I think, you know, we've got, we've definitely, we've got to be more aware about some of the things we've got great um, advocates, government affairs people, obviously. Um, but a lot of it is, is grassroots and having those relationships, um, with the local, um, people. Um, yeah, you've got to do the Hill visits. It's all about relationships, building those relationships. And that takes time. Um, and just, you know, continuing to be present and do what we do best. Um, it's good. Good. If I could build on that, um, for better, or for worse, because I've got in this point of care stuff, I've got asked to go to a lot of um, state legislators and testify. And what you realize very quickly is, first, people don't understand what we as pharmacists can do. And if you're sitting back waiting for them to discover, they're not going to do it. I remember I was just in Chicago in front of the Illinois uh, you know, legislators. The governor signed a bill that allowed pharmacists to do test and treat. Uh, and one of the committees was chaired by a physician and they were not happy. Uh, so they wanted it to be brought back. And so we went in and testified. And as we're sitting there and telling why we we're doing this, why it was important for equitable access to care, why it was important for patients, one of his colleagues said, well, it seems like it's stupid that we're here. Why didn't anybody tell us that they were doing this in other countries and in other states and everywhere else? This seems like a slam dunk. And you just saw the physician go, <laughs> but unless we speak up for ourselves and show that you're never going to like let people know we can do it. And it doesn't take a magic person. I mean, first of all, I'm not the person you want representing you uh, in front of your legislature. So you should be doing that uh, with your contacts and your students should be doing that. Uh, they have connections, you know, to folks. So it's important have more people run for office. We've got two up in Congress right now, but we could have more. So yeah. And you know, the other thing too, is that we have now um, staffers on the Hill um, that are pharmacists, uh, working committees and working for members of Congress. That's a great early career path opportunity. So Dr. Wu, you have a question. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Jing Wu. Um, some know me as the geospatial pharmacist, but also um, I'm the director of data strategy and innovation at the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. My question is for both of you. Speaking of speaking up, um, not everyone gets to come to this awesome Pinnacle Awards. If we were to go back to our pharmacy community and say one thing about each of your practices, um, what would you want us to say? So for example, I'm like, oh, I was at the Pinnacle Awards on Sunday and I got to hear from these amazing speakers. Did you hear of the dispensary of hope? They X, Y, Z. What would each of you say? Would like elevator, us to say. Your elevator speech. <laughs> Tell us your elevator speech. Well, I mean, really, we are a success because it's a collective effort. It is all about partnerships. We've got, it would be just unable to do what we do without manufacturers, healthcare providers, and academic institutions. And it has been an innovative model that has grown and been proven. Um, we've built that trust within the, the community um, for getting access to medications from pharmaceutical companies. It's donated to our distribution center, and then we can partner with nonprofit health systems, pharmacies, clinics across the country for them to give it to patients free of charge um, for their low-income uninsured patients. And your elevator speech? My elevator speech is um, antimicrobial stewardship. Pharmacists in the community can do wonderful jobs, and we've demonstrated that with the point-of-care testing, they can reduce inappropriate unwarranted antibiotics by about 60%. Uh, that's impressive. And then going to charm, you don't know what you're doing with antibiotics unless you're tracking it. And this is an important thing for all health systems. And with charm, we put in a lot of legwork and we're offering these services for free. Uh, so if you have a health system who has not yet engaged in outpatient stewardship, send them my way. I mean, we're in Arkansas, we're in South Carolina, we're in Idaho. We want your state too. And we've been fortunate for that. And we just want to help with the appropriate use of antibiotics. Because unfortunately, unlike um, antihypertensives and stuff like that, if you use it wrong, there's consequences. Patients you know, pay money, they have side effects and so forth, but you don't lose the drug. Antibiotics, you lose the drug to resistance. And so 
this is really important and it's something that's a really low hurdle uh, that we can all take part in now. We, we have, I'm gonna take one more question. We've got a room full of people, but we have residents and fellows here. And part of your learning experience as a resident or fellow is to learn how to ask questions in an audience. So I, I uh, would like for one of our residents or fellows, I don't care which one, but one, <laughs> one of you, one of you to uh, ask a great question without the assistance of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's the only intelligence I have. Cool. Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Nick Brush, uh, one of the education fellows uh, this year, and um, this is about innovation. So what process do you guys use? How do you know to jump on the idea, like the aha moment, like the charm and cape and all those things in Dispensary Club? How did you know that that was an idea to pursue? That was a really great question. <laughs> wow, that's great. I just want everybody to make note that we bring on board the best residents and fellows at APHA. There you go. <laughs> All right. You have an answer for that. How do you know it was the thing? You don't. I mean, and that's it. It's a leap of faith. You know, you, we mentioned the passion. Uh, we mentioned the interest. And you may not realize that it's going to be, you know, effective for a while. Uh, again, there were many times with point of care where I started to question, is this really going to happen? In my heart, I thought, it just makes sense. It's so easy. It should be. It should be. It should be. And try to convince an entire nation of pharmacists, healthcare system, everybody else, what you believe is right. If you start with that in mind, you're going to drive yourself crazy and just give up. So just sometimes stick to your guns and just say, this, this should be something that's important. I think it will be, but you're never going to know, uh, you know, for a while down the road. And you don't go into it thinking, man, someday I'm going to invent the next light bulb because, let's be honest, nobody knew there was going to be a light bulb. Yeah. And I'll even go back to what you mentioned earlier, your why and where are the needs. So, you know, we have gaps in coverage and we've got individuals across the country that don't have access to medicine. And I wasn't there in the early founding days, but, um, you know, taking branded samples to clinics and was probably very different and innovative. And so pivoting that and going directly to the source to manufacturers, you, you just have to try it. And hopefully if it's a bad idea, you fail fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if you, any of the startup things like, okay, well, if it's a bad idea, you just want that thing to fail fast so that then you can pivot. Um, but you know, there's all of these different tools and things like PDSA and, um, where you're testing small things and then you're seeing what works and what doesn't work. And then you can pivot from that. But. Well, let's, uh, can, let, can I ask yeah, one yeah. question of the audience first? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 And so just a, a curiosity. Before the pandemic, how many of you guys ever heard going into a pharmacy for a test, like an influenza test? Wow, you guys were really. After the pandemic, how many of you guys have heard? Please, everybody raise it. How many, <laughs> and with that, how many of you guys have actually gotten swabbed in a pharmacy? I was hoping it was going to be more than that. Uh, but okay. But, you know, for the, the students and stuff like that, you know, for me, this is really cool. Yeah. yeah, I haven't met these people, but stuff that I've done have impacted impact. them. Yeah. Nice. And so that's, it, it's cool. Yeah. It yeah, doesn't it take a, you know, a special individual. It just takes the whys, the wheres, and the support yeah. and the ability to stick with it and ask good questions. Let's give our uh, award recipients one more round of applause. Thank you, Dave.